So good afternoon. I'm Jennifer, and I'm very pleased to be here with Eric Gunderson, CEO of Mapbox. For those of you who are not familiar with the company, um, it uh, recently raised $164 million from uh, SoftBank. It just made an acquisition of a company in Minsk. Uh, it's dri driving into some new areas, such as uh, autonomous uh, cars. Um, and we're going to hear all about that today. Um, but let's start at the beginning, Eric. Um, a big focus of the conference uh, at Slush is doing well by doing good. Mm -hmm. Tell us how the company got started. Yeah, we, uh, I did not wake up one day and want to create a mapping company to, to try to compete with Google or anything. It was, uh, it was much more organic. I was actually, you know, I was in Washington, D.C., uh, working with the U.N., World Bank, Doctors Without Borders, literally on, on the ground uh, on projects, whether we're, we're doing some deforestation work in the Congo with the World Resources Institute, uh, health mapping. In, uh, in Abuja, uh, in Nigeria, uh, in the 20, yeah, 2010 floods in Pakistan. So here you are trying to help, whether it's UNHCR or, or different, different aid agencies, um, you know, bring relief, build up uh, certain parts of the economy better. And uh, every time we we're working on a project, we needed, uh, we needed to use data better. And if we use data better, we could be smarter about how we we're deploying the project. And honestly, a lot of that a lot of that data was geo. Mm -hmm. So we started getting good at making maps, right? I mean, we were a bunch of developers that, uh, that were basically running a consulting company. It's pretty audacious to go up against Google, TomTom, Tom, here. Um, what has that journey been like? Long. <laughs> uh, like, this is funny. Somebody, somebody else was talking about this the other night. It's like, Nothing, nothing happens overnight, and it all happens slower than, than you imagine. Uh, look, what I wanted to do was to have tools that would allow our team to do our job better. Whether that's you know, building like the Photoshop for maps, and next thing you know, it's like that didn't really matter because where we were working, there, were, you know, the, you know, there was no map. The map was blank. So we had to get good at making the, the lower lying map part. So it was, like, it was really, really organic. And one of the advantages, uh, one of the advantages we had was here we were, a team, slowly getting to work on a problem. And we got to be really meticulous in how we built. And we didn't try to go out there and build everything all at once. It was like, first, we're going to build this design tool. Next, we're going to actually make it scalable like this, a dot, the dot. And um, it allowed us to build product in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a really incremental way. And then we used it, right? Because again, we, we didn't take any outside funding until four years ago. This is important. Like we had, we we built the product to be used by us on projects. So, you know, whatever we needed, you know, we we went and built it and then refactored it. And and you do that for years, you really start making something pretty hardened. The mapping product is open source. Like how? Why did you go that route? How how key is that to, you know, what you do and who the company is, the company yeah. culture? Yeah. Uh, look, I. When, when, we, when we were starting, I mean, I, I bought the domain name mapbox.com in 2008. And at that point, especially on the investor side, nobody knew. Like, if you, if you talk to anybody about open source, their analogy was like, oh, you're the red hat of. And it's like, ah, no. And oh, wait, you're doing open source, so how are you going to make IP? How are you going to make money? Like, the, back then, there was, a there was almost like an inherent contradiction between you know, in uh, releasing code that's open source, investing in open data communities, and building up proprietary tech. And I, what we've been able to prove over the last couple of years is that open source technology development and being open by default creates better product, builds better culture, helps with recruit. Like, we have a better platform because we open source core parts of it. The code's actually better. And none of what we've open sourced competes in any way with this crazy proprietary API stack that we've been building up. Same thing on the open data side. You know, every, every time we identify a new street, every time we identify you know, that, there, that there's a restriction that you can't turn here uh, with the data, we, we put that stuff back in OpenStreetMap. Or we work with open addresses, or we work with these open data communities, Wikidata. Uh, and 
investing and contributing back actually makes the quality of the data better. You're working with the ground truth community. And it, you can integrate this into how you do business. OK. So let's go back to what you mentioned a moment ago, that you bootstrapped, right, until mm -hmm. four years ago. Um, what shaped that decision? Um, and what advice would you give to entrepreneurs yeah. in this room about how long do you wait before you go out and raise money from VCs? Do you have any cautions about, you know, taking, putting a limit on how much you take, uh, how much you give away of your company, and so forth? Yeah. So at the, just to be clear, at the time. So let me do, let me answer this question from my perspective in 2013. I had no idea what I was doing. Okay. Right? Like I, I'm on the East Coast. I'm in Washington D.C. This is Washington D.C. might be the capital, but it is not the startup capital. Okay. And so you're. You, having no idea how the venture scene works, with the one exception that we saw certain uh, uh, venture-backed startups in the open source space, and they basically overplayed their hand. And they started messing with some of the open community dynamics. And so actually, at the, in 2013, uh, myself and honestly the team in general didn't really understand how, how venture worked. Mm -hmm. And honestly, we're, we're a little like hesitant uh, like we had, we, had, we had full control. We would go out, we could get a project, we'd make money on that project, and then we could build what we want. And we weren't sure what would, uh, what would change. But uh, the reality was 2013, here we were, we, had, we were powering the maps for Foursquare by then, at their height, Evernote, USA Today. You're, you're, we start having this level of traction, and at the same time, you're still figuring out how to make money. So you're like still doing project work. So your team, your team was, like, the team was just spread thin. And we wanted to go all in. And that was it. It was like, this is our moment to get out of consulting. We hated consulting. We knew we had built a great product. Let's take the chance. OK. And what was your experience like with your first round? Uh, so I, I uh, had, a, had a really uh, a supportive friend, uh, George Hoyam, literally put me in the back of his, uh, his Prius and drove me up and down Sand Hill Road and walked me in to meet wow. with people. And it's, it's an incredibly fortunate experience. But he's just like, look. He, Eric doesn't want to raise. He's skeptical about VCs. Can you talk to him about how you work? And it was like, that was an amazing moment. And here I am. Uh, I got pulled together a deck. I was like, look, here's how we built the mapping stack. Here's how we're monetizing. And they're like, oh, you, you wait, you make money? Wait, how are you funded? And they're like, huh, wait, are you profitable? And it's like, wait, that's actually, that's, that's kind of how it works. <laughs> like, to be bootstrapped, you have to make money to make payroll. And uh, it, in the end, obviously, that puts you in an amazing position in terms of dilution, right? right? I mean, we were, we were sitting in, in, a, in a really powerful seat when we were raising because we were profitable, because we were making money. All that said, we, uh, we got incredibly lucky. So in the summer of 2013, Waze got bought by Google for 1.1 billion. <laughs> uh, we closed in September 2013. Uh, so you can, you can imagine at that time, we did, I mean, it was a Series A. It was, it was, it was a big Series A back then. It was like 10 million. $10 million. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now you've raised money from SoftBank. Mm -hmm. What was your meeting like with Maoshi Fun? Yeah. Uh, they're, the team over at, at, at SoftBank is just is, is, is incredible. I mean, Masason has, isn't just everything, basically, everything you've been seeing him talk about and we, that people have been reading, it's true. Like, this guy is looking X number of years out. He's seeing how the pieces sit together. So when we sat down, you know, we weren't talking about maps. We were talking about the future of how cities were going to be built and how people were going to move around in them. I mean, look, look, look at how he's thinking about ride sharing. Look at how he's thinking about on-demand logistics. I mean, look, look at I mean, the, the, the conversation was like, what, do you, what is even a map for a robot look like? Right? This is, um, it, was, it, was, it was incredible. So I, I got to... Uh, sat down back in back in Tokyo in July, and but also you know just you know over over a couple months got to meet with uh, the larger larger bench from Rajiv to Deep to Vikas. You have you know and that's really important. I, I think I think here it's you know for me it wasn't just um, working you know sitting down with Masasone and seeing this larger vision, but when you take this amount of money you better put people next to you that have experience to be building a longer play. And that's, um, 
I really, I, I really felt that in, in his larger team. So let's talk about that longer play um, and, and, and <clears throat> where mapping is going. Because um, if I understand correctly, it's going to kind of fade into the background. It's still going to be key, but it's not going to be the end product, right? So what does that mean for the future of your business, and how are you preparing for yeah. that different type of future? Uh, I mean, I think I mean, every location is becoming more and more core to all of the apps we are developing, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean you're looking at a map to get around. I mean, so often, every time you pick up a, you know, a Galaxy 8 uh, phone right now, we, you get to see where you are. We're telling you that. You're not, you're not actually needing to look at a map or like the power of, in, of understanding the uh, estimated time of arrivals and what the real-time traffic environment is and the margins that a logistics company can make on that. You know, like I, get, I get to watch my groceries delivered on Instacart and I mean that's, that's my ETA, right? Or you know, lunch being delivered by DoorDash. We're creating a level of efficiencies because these developers are taking our tech, taking our APIs and integrating them into their other processes and integrating them into their own proprietary algorithms. So I get to put out the building blocks to let everybody, everybody here build, build really cool stuff. And then okay. what's fun for me is I then get to go, I live almost vicariously through other developers, right? I mean, we're, we're a platform. We don't have an app. We make it really easy for people to then go build their own app. So do you see um, Mapbox becoming a platform for AR services, yeah. um, autonomous vehicles? What are yeah. some of the services that you the majority, all right, so right now, I mean, the majority of the maps uh, are highly visual. I mean, we're known, like, a lot of designers love working with Mapbox because you can tweak all the look and feel. Uh, for example, look at Snapchat maps. I mean, the design that their team did using our platform is exquisite, right? I mean, they, they, Snapchat built a Bitmoji world, or the Weather Channel wants to show, you know, a, a storm front moving in at 60 frames a second. You know, people are doing really cool visuals. The, the reality with AR, Location matters even more. It becomes like fundamental. And you start showing micro context of what's going on. You don't need to actually show a full map. You want to be able to just have enough orientation, whether that's orientation to affect like gameplay. Like if you're like, okay, these zombies should only start coming up here when you enter a park, or whether it affects directions, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you and I are sitting in the car and you're driving right now, happens to be back in my hometown, I get to say, hey, turn right up here. You're then you're then gonna drive for a mile. To, I'll give you the bare minimum directions that you need to get us there. And you're going to start having this micro context of, in, in context of AR. I think AR now is honestly, is going to be not just bigger than the browser. This is going to be, this is going to be bigger than mobile. And wow. we've been talking about this. And that's, that's saying a lot, right? Because you're already in what, like 300 million mobile phones? Yeah, every, we have every month 300 million, 350 million people are touching our APIs. And the important part about that is, is what that means from the, the interaction, right? You, that, that, that network of sensors, right? So we get anonymized, aggregated data back. And it's that data that, that starts going in and shows you new roads, shows you the traffic on the roads, starts showing you the pulse of a, of a city. Uh, and you know, today, we're collecting over 200 million miles of anonymous data that goes a day back into the map. And uh, you start having this true network effect where every time a developer goes out with using Mapbox, all of their users benefit from the existing network and then start feeding back into it. You just made an acquisition in Minsk. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that company. Why did you buy them? What do they bring to the table? Yeah, and I mean, we, right now, we are very interested in scaling up on the deep learning side. Okay. Uh, shocking, right? Because I'm not sure how many people people here have heard AI in the last uh, in the last day and a half, but I, I feel it's about every 20 minutes. Um, but to do to do this right, you need like insane depth on the data science side, and people really really good at math. And so we were working with a team over in Minsk, Belarus. Uh, first met through some friends back in the open source space. Uh, Maps Me was doing a lot of work with OpenStreetMap, and you end up it's kind of cool. Like you meet. I think on the acquisition side, it's not like you just like go cold buy a company. Like you, you want to integrate a team. You want that energy of a team, and you want that expertise to grow. Sure. So, uh, yeah, we uh, we brought on a team that we'd been uh, working with for about 18 months in Minsk, and now we're rapidly scaling that. 
And, uh, you know, uh, Minsk Belarus is just an amazing place to do, uh, do business right now. You have a very, uh, very aggressive, high educated developer group. Um, are you opening an office on Helsinki as well? We are. Uh, for slightly for slightly different reasons. I mean, it's not you don't just go places looking for you know quote unquote developers. You go places looking for a kind of expertise. And what's amazing about the the skill set in, in Helsinki, you have this history of companies of some of the biggest, most powerful companies in the world, and you've had you've had developers working at these companies for years, doing really low-lying optimizations. I mean, last night, you know, I'm, I'm looking at people's phones as they're showing me some of the shaders and the rendering uh, tech they're doing. That is like super low-level C++ optimization work, and there there is a base of talent in this city uh, for that. And uh, also, a lot of people here have been thinking uh, thinking about AR and VR for a while in the video game space. So I'm really, you know, we've we, we currently have four people here. We're now formalizing that. The local government has made this super easy. It's like when you walk into a new country, you got to like, you got to get legal, you got to get do the taxes right, da da da. And so it's been like super nice being welcomed here properly. Talk a little bit about the kind, the people that you've met here, the developers that you've met here, the energy uh, at, at the slush? conference. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the it's crazy. I've only seen like a, I feel like I've seen like a tenth of what I wanted to see. Uh, there's a lot of builders here. Like people, like the, the energy of when you walk by a table and you get to see an app, uh, people are building some pretty, uh, pretty awesome tech. And uh, the, the, just the energy of the last, uh, last two days has, uh, has been, been incredible. What are you hoping to get out of the show? Like, are you looking for specific kinds of technologies or to connect with a certain type of person? Yeah, the m most important thing about coming to an event like this is um, talking to people that are using your APIs. And getting first-hand feedback. You know, I was talking to a cool uh, motorcycle app, and it turns out, you know, as a two-wheel app, traffic is different. Road conditions can be different. So, like, what kind of different routing profiles are there? A lot of people are doing more and more location-based video game development, and hearing details about how they want uh, the the actual data transfer to be super efficient and performant. Coming down and hearing certain feedback pieces on that is just like. You want, I mean, the goal here is to be close to the people that are building cool stuff. Okay. You're going to be around for the rest of the day? Yeah. Okay. Go and connect with him if you've got something great to show him. Um, and I, with that, I'd like to um, ask uh, our audience to give a nice round of applause to Eric. Beautiful. Hey, Thank you so much.